Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. All right. Thanks everybody for joining. We're just gonna let everybody file in here and then we will get started. Hi everyone, we're just gonna give it a few minutes here um, while people file in. Um, we should get started in a, in, a, in a bit here. All right, Cam, um, you might as well get started um, and we will, yeah. Sounds great. Well, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us for our um, FY 2020 uh, year-end earnings and uh, in particular uh, Q1 2021 earnings call. We appreciate everybody taking the time to be here with us today. And uh, without any further ado, um, let's just uh, jump right into it. Uh, I'd also uh, really like to thank um, uh, Paul Sun, our CFO, who's here today and will be reviewing our financial results, and our president, Scott Larson, uh, who will, along with Roly, be helping facilitate uh, questions that have been sent in and will be coming in throughout the, the call, I'm sure. So I'm just going to do a share screen here and, uh, and just pull up our deck. Some of this will be review um, for some of you, um, uh, but also it will add context to some of the questions that we'll answer later on. And of course, there was a significant update um, in here as well. So as um, I think probably most of you are aware, Dragonfly is the oldest operating commercial drone manufacturer and solutions provider uh, in uh, certainly in North America and potentially the world. The Dragonfly has been uh, developing, designing, building, manufacturing, uh, distributing, selling, operating, uh, and servicing drones um, since actually uh, right around the mid uh, 90s. And um, this is one of our uh, significant strategic advantages uh, in the market, not just because we've got a bunch of experience uh, in the actual manufacturing and a fantastic engineering bench uh, and AI bench, but also because we have seen the cycles before and have a pretty good sense of how to uh, bring products to market through the different cycles that the drone industry has been through and will continue to go through as it's now going into a point or an inflection point of exponential growth. Um, on our leadership team, uh, just for review, um, uh, I'm uh, very fortunate to be uh, CEO, co-founder and chairman uh, of Dragonfly. I'm uh, joined by uh, Scott Larson, who is our president. Uh, Scott and I have worked together in the past on a couple of different projects uh, in the aerospace uh, area in particular. Scott does have a couple of significant exits underneath his belt. Uh, most recently, uh, in the last number of years, has sold two uh, satellite companies uh, in particular. Scott brings a wealth of M&A experience, banking experience, but also operational leadership. And um, uh, I can't think of a better person, quite frankly, to be building a billion dollar enterprise uh, with. John Bogosius, we're super lucky to have uh, been wooed away from uh, FLIR uh, while he was uh, there uh, with um, Aero um, <clears throat> uh, as part of an acquisition uh, uh, where he came from. Uh, heading up the uh, public safety area. Uh, John is now our uh, senior VP of uh, global sales and has uh, a number of sales teams that are uh, reporting into him. 
He brings in a tremendous amount of industry experience, in particular in the, the public safety and security space where we've got uh, uh, a great uh, pedigree and legendary experience, but also across the entire drone uh, industry. Uh, Paul Sun is our CFO. Paul and I have been grinding this out for uh, coming up on eight years. Uh, and um, we're uh, super pleased to have uh, Paul with us today to review our financial results. So. Um, just uh, for review, uh, we have four primary revenue streams uh, as a total solutions provider. We do believe strategically that the number one uh, drone player in the commercial space in North America will emerge as a company that uh, has the capability to service the Fortune 5000 companies and therefore needs a broad capability. So we bring a broad capability largely due to the fact that we've been around uh, for 20 plus years in both in contract engineering, uh, where we service companies like an aero environment, for example, and military contractors, um, where uh, we can take uh, concepts and turn them into projects and commercialized um, um, uh, vehicles or commercialized uh, entities uh, in their entirety. And you know, the, the ability to do this from a contract engineering standpoint has uh, also given us the bench strength to be able to develop our own products and our own sales infrastructure. So whether it's quadcopters like you see with our commander or whether it's our joint sales efforts and, and project um, uh, venture with uh, Aero Environment on the Quantix line, uh, whether it's uh, our health security services line or whether it's the artificial intelligence we build, all of these are components of actually building a drone solution. Drones, uh, certainly 10 years ago, even five years ago, were all about the hardware. They're all about how much payload and how much battery life you could take. Today, they're not about that at all. Today, they're about the data. Today, they're about what can be delivered. Today, they're about the solution that's provided. And I think that's why we are so well positioned to be the number one player in North America over the coming years. Uh, we also have full flight services. What we often see with uh, customers that come to us that are looking to buy uh, drones, whether they're our product drones or whether they're specialized drones, uh, they hire a few uh, flight crews, we'll do some training for them, and then they realize the utility of these drones and the and the incredible data or utility they're providing for the organization. And boom, what happens is they need more flight services than they can actually provide themselves. So we end up supplementing those with additional flight services, which then also leads into things like data storage, data management, data analysis. And so whether it's in the forestry industry, the energy industry, the mining industry of which we've signed significant contracts recently, we actually provide usable data, not just store it, but we provide analysis back to those customers. What the customers want is the data and the information that gives them a competitive advantage. And a drone, almost more than any other device, can provide that. But it's not just the drone, it's the entire solution that comes with it, which again is the strategic direction that we've chosen to take to become a solution provider that can do everything from manufacturing right through to data analysis. Those are the organizations that the Fortune 5000 are looking to work with. The verticals that we cross, of course, are everything from public safety and military and agriculture, mining, energy, and even health and public safety. <clears throat> Dragonfly has a history of being innovative. Pretty much every year we have come out with a new and innovative approach to something in the drone industry, which is followed by a patent or two, of course. Now we do not publish all of our IP. Uh, we keep the vast majority of our IP under wraps uh, because most of the IP that we put out there ends up uh, getting copied or used in some form or fashion. And we're not a litigious company. Our objective is not to be a patent troll or a licensing type company. Our objective is to be an operational solutions provider trying to work and gain the greatest amount of margin uh, for our shareholders and the greatest amount of uh, advantage for our customers. So whether it was in 1999 when we commercialized the first quadcopter or whether it is in 2009 when the first drones were used by law enforcement or whether it was 2019 where we put solar powered panels on drones to have them stay up for literally a day at a time right through to last year where we launched camera systems on our drones that can read things like your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your blood pressure. I mean, absolutely groundbreaking uh, technology innovation <clears throat> that not just provides us great customer uh, context and great customer contacts, but also pushes the entire industry ahead. As an example, just one of our patents two years ago won a $190 million lawsuit and took one of the most, well, certainly the largest drone company in the world and took their main drones off the market for a number of months. That's the prolific nature by which we design and, and it's in the ethos of our company. We believe that we're strategically positioned to continue that over the next 20 plus years. 
The main paradigm shift, of course, in the drone industry has been that it's not just about hardware. In fact, hardware is important, but it's what the hardware does. It's the data or the delivery or the solution that that hardware provides, which is exactly why to be the number one player in the space, you just can't provide a low cost solution. You need a low cost drone. You need to be able to provide a total solution. And that's where we have built our infrastructure. <clears throat> The other key thing that's driving growth for Dragonfly and why we would be positioned as one of the largest in the world, and if not the uh, number one drone provider in North America, is the fact that inside of North America, which is the largest drone opportunity and market in the world, is domestic um, uh, security, uh, domestic uh, manufacturing, the domestic solution provision. And so being only a handful of drone manufacturers that are in the <clears throat> that are in North America is incredibly important. We've been around for 20 plus years. We saw the incredible growth that happened in the consumer space and in the small commercial space. We saw large companies emerge with brand name backers, with brand name CEOs, most of which all tried to buy Dragonfly at one time or another, and all of which are gone today, except for a very few, and none of which have the history nor the patent portfolio that Dragonfly does. We believe this is incredibly important as we move forward with our customers, led by our incredible board of directors, with the access that we have at all levels of government and all levels of industry to be able to provide the solutions that drones are now starting to provide in changing society itself. A little bit about our products and services. Of course, we've got the full product suite of uh, quadcopter drones led by our commander. Uh, we have ground robots, which again, not a lot of people are all that familiar with, but this is a ground robot that can stand up at eight feet. It can lay, lay straight down. It can go underneath the car. Those wheels actually fold in on themselves, which is an incredible patent, can climb stairs. This thing can go in water, and this is all for under $30,000. It's this type of innovation that allows us to get customer access, and all of these things actually run from a single pad. So we can run a quadcopter, a ground drone, a, uh, a Tango fixed-wing aircraft, all from a single device, right? Uh, autonomously or not autonomously. And we've learned these things because we're actually in working with customers on a daily basis. And they're the ones that tell us what they want innovated. We've sold over 9,000 drones just to public safety organizations in North America, whether it's the US Marshals, the Border Patrol, multiple hundreds of sheriff departments or federal agencies. It's these customers that inform us as to what we're gonna build next. We don't build things on spec. We don't have an R&D department that's building on spec. We have an R&D department that's building on customer requirements which is also why we have full flight services and we know exactly what those services need to be. In the case of mining, we had mining companies that are coming to us looking for magnetometer type readings and analysis. And so we are now not just uh, flying those services, but we're actually manufacturing specific products in these particular industries that make our payloads either more sensitive or more effective for the flight services that we actually provide. And then, of course, in the last year, and quite unexpectedly, we were thrown into the telehealth and the health safety industry because we had a customer come to us that had a need. And that need was to be able to measure social distancing from afar. And of course, we took it to the next level so that you could actually measure heart rates and respiratory rates and vital rates. And that has spawned into an entire health services division that will likely be the largest division in the company this year, just based on our pipeline that we currently have in place. <clears throat> the other amazing thing, uh, but, well, the most amazing thing that we feel that we have um, is our clients. <clears throat> now, of course, we have these clients because we're really fortunate to have incredible people on our team. But this is a client base that few, if not any, commercial drone companies um, uh, can boast to. And I don't think I'm out of line if I were to say that um, uh, everybody on this list, at least that's shown up here, is a repeat customer. We have a client base that informs how we continue to innovate. And this is our largest strategic advantage in terms of how we bring products to market, knowing what products to bring to market, and having the cash flow input to be able to bring these products to market without having to dip into huge capital costs necessarily for um, R&D. 
Now, specifically, just to spend a little bit of time on the highlights just from this last quarter, of course, we had revenue growth, and I'm going to let Paul talk, speak to this uh, more as he uh, uh, highlights our financial performance. But we had revenue growth of over 200% uh, percent, uh, Q over Q. Now, this is the fourth quarter in a row that we've seen this type of growth. And certainly from my perspective, I see no end in sight in terms of this type of growth, even though every quarter it gets exponentially larger. The uh, the inbound work that we are doing, the calls that we are taking, the initiatives that we have, and the products that we have built, um, uh, certainly at this point, uh, I can't imagine us ever being able to fill the pipeline requests that are inbound right now. Our growth right now is a matter of scale and how we scale to meet that growth. So it's a luxurious position to be in because we actually get to focus on hiring the best people to fit the requirements that our customers are asking us to fill, as opposed to necessarily figuring out what to build and what to sell. <clears throat> our gross margin percentage was 33%, which is still an incredibly uh, strong margin and continues to increase, say, over Q, Q4. And that's even though our contract engineering business, certainly as a percentage and due to COVID, came down quite a bit, which is a very high margin business. Again, I'll let Paul speak to these things. Um, we did raise uh, in Q1 uh, over $16 million uh, US, uh, which now gives us a balance sheet of, um, uh, of close to $20 million. And uh, that is the type of firepower we need to meet the customer demand that we have at, uh, that's being required or that, that's being asked of us. It also gives our existing customers and the new customers that are coming to the table a high degree of confidence when they see that we have that financial strength in place and is therefore increasing our exponential growth. Um, we have had some questions around the dilution in the stock and such. And while it's painful to take that dilution, the growth metric of the company and the valuation that we believe that stock will receive as these customers come to light, because they believed in us and they saw a strong balance sheet, we believe will more than offset that dilution that has happened in the market for us. Now, we did secure several contracts. A couple of uh, highlighted ones, or one in particular, is a million dollar flight services contract for mining in particular. And so I believe that we won this type of contract because of our innovation in the space and the relationship that we built with our excellent um, customer, Windfall Geotech. And so combined with them, we have a service offering that provides an AI analysis based on the data that we're able to collect for customers they bring to the table. This million dollar contract is already, uh, we've already fulfilled on half a million dollars uh, of it. And we have full expectation that we'll expand this program throughout the year. I don't see other public uh, companies out there that are in the drone space announcing these size of contracts. And this is just a service contract. And I believe it, it shows nothing but a one small example of the potential of the industry. And that's just one vertical. But because we can do these types of things, because that is a real solution for Windfall Geotech and a real solution for their customers, we have a plethora of more customers that are showing up in the, in the space. Our ethos is all about how we give our customers a strategic advantage in their industry. And the more that we can do that, this as being an example, the more and more that we will win that space and position ourselves as number one in the industry. Um, we also closed the acquisition of Vital Intelligence, and Vital Intelligence is the underlying IP that allows us to simply use a camera to, at a distance, be able to uh, read heart rates and respiratory rates, um, blood pressures, social distancing, mask wearing, and things like that. Now, the implications of this initially out of the gate, obviously, were for COVID, but the, uh, the true measure of this is, is in telehealth and in public safety. We have several military use cases that are being that, that uh, this will be applied to, uh, dozens of public safety um, and crowd control cases that this will be applied to. Um, it all works within the confines of the existing privacy issues out there, and telehealth itself is a massive market that uh, this technology is uh, being applied into. Um, you know, I personally believe this is a billion dollar product line over the next number of years alone. But again, it's come to us because we have such a strong customer base that trusts us to design and build these types of uh, this type of innovation. This underlying technology was so important to us and we see such growth rate that we were very fortunate to successfully uh, acquire it and own the IP within Dragonfly. <clears throat> At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Sun, our CFO, to discuss our financial results. Paul? All right. Yeah, thanks very much, Cam. 
And uh, here's a quick snapshot of what Cam just walked you through on the high level. You can see here Q1 revenues for this year was driven by product sales, and that was predominantly coming from Candrone, an acquisition we closed on April 30th of last year. So the same quarter last year didn't include Candrone and was made up of custom engineering work. And as Cam mentioned, you can see here, the engineering work tends to have higher gross margin. The net loss and comprehensive loss for the three months ended March 31st include a non-cash change in fair value of derivative liability for US $41 million due to the company's uh, successful Reg A offering. And the loss would otherwise be $3.9 million, which is quite reasonable when compared to the loss from the same period last year as the company is now public so I had more marketing and professional costs that didn't occur in that same period last year. Following that, the loss per share would be approximately four cents versus what you see here on the slide, taking into account that, that one non-cash derivative liability. Uh, you, we have a working capital surplus, and you can see here we had a positive change of $19 million due to the success of that reggae offering that closed this quarter. Next slide, please. So here you can see our total assets increased substantially quarter over quarter, which is largely the closing of the Reg A financing, along with the booking of the closing of our vital intelligence acquisition that, that Cam spoke of earlier. The working capital as of March 31 would have been a surplus of 20 million. Um, when you X out that, again, that non-cash change in fair value derivative liability. And you can see here we have minimal debt. Next slide, please. So I spoke earlier about quarter over quarter or, or year over year changes. And now I just kind of want to highlight the, the quarter over quarter changes. So you'll, you'll see here that revenue for Q1, again, uh, was 1.5 million. Uh, that increased about 3.6% from 1.49 million from Q4 of last year. And that was due to stronger product sales. Uh, gross margin percentage for Q1, 33% compared to 22% in, the, in Q4 of last year. And again, that's an increase due to the sales mix of the product. And from an operating expenses perspective, Q1 did increase uh, you know, from Q4, uh, and that's largely due to the higher fees associated with the work around the reggae financing and the vital intelligence acquisition and the close uh, that came from that. So again, total comprehensive loss was 44 million. Uh, compared to 3.7 million in Q4, but again, backing out that 41 million non-cash liability, uh, we would have come in at 3.9, which again is very reasonable given the context of this quarter versus what we saw in Q4. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Ken. Thanks, Paul. Excellent, as always. <clears throat> So the key takeaways that um, that we're hopeful that uh, you'll uh, consider as um, as you graciously are shareholders or prospective shareholders of a company is first of all um, we have the team we have an extremely experienced team that's worked together on projects before has built successful companies before with billion dollar plus exits in multiple industries all tech mind you uh, and including uh, very deep in aerospace uh, we have a board of directors that um, is certainly for this size a company that we are second to none that includes everybody from uh, Andy Card, uh, the former uh, White House Chief of Staff, as well as the Secretary of Transportation, uh, Mr. John Mitnick, who is the GC at uh, Homeland Security, a board of advisors that's, uh, that's certainly as impressive and gives us access in a manner, a very strategic access uh, in a manner that, that really isn't afforded generally companies uh, of our size. But I think we can see that in the type of growth uh, and the type of support that we are now getting out there. Listen, we have technology in many respects, even though we've been around a long time, we're a startup because we're, we're at such a, at the early, early stage of an industry um, that's projected to be well into the multiples and multiples of tens of billions of dollars. And so if you think about the runway that's in front of us and who will dominate in that space in the future, you know, you, you it's rarity, uh, it's off, not often that you can look and say, okay, well, who has dominated in a brand new space? And on many respects, you can say that we have. And so I think we're well positioned, not just as a team, but also from a technology platform and a proven ability to get that technology commercialized uh, to market. So um, 
uh, I often get a question, well, what if you're not number one and you're number four? Well, okay, so then we're only a couple billion dollar company. Um, really the opportunity here uh, is, is it's our success uh, is, is only there for us to screw up. But this team is not about being number four. This team is about being number one. And we're confident and we're laser focused on being that number one provider. And then of course, traction. So again, while the industry or while the commercial industry is now just starting to take off, you're seeing that we're actually producing that traction. And that's uh, where I think uh, you will continue to see us shine. Uh, if you look at the type of information that we put out to the market, um, uh, we, we talk about our customers. Right? And we talk about the, the projects that we're winning and we talk about our products in the context of how they're getting used by customers. And you will continue to see that, uh, that culture from us and that uh, ethos from us. Primarily because that's what our customers want to see. We want to show validation to our customers that we're your winning business and that we have earned their business and that we're going to earn more of their business. That in turn is exactly what helps our shareholders because it drives our numbers. Um, we also uh, tend to look at projects that are exciting. Uh, while we, we have our bread and uh, butter uh, industries and our bread and butter um, <clears throat> product lines, we definitely always want to be pushing the edge on some of the product lines that are not bread and butter, that are incredibly exciting. And because that's what allows us to continue to attract the type of talent to our AI bench, our engineering bench, our sales teams, our marketing teams, our executive team, in order to be a part of something exciting, in order to be a part of something that can be meaningful and can be that number one player in the market. So I know that there was a number of questions um, that came in. And um, <clears throat> the one question that, that, uh, that uh, has come in that I'm just going to address right off the bat before I turn it over to, uh, to Scott and Roly to address uh, a number of others is the status of our NASDAQ uh, listing. So quite some time ago, uh, well, uh, four months ago, a reasonable time ago, uh, we announced that we had intent to uh, move to the NASDAQ. So the executive team, uh, in fact, the entire company has worked at a feverish pace in order to make this happen. Uh, we are hopeful and expectant to be able to provide an official update uh, on this. Uh, but I can say with um, uh, uh, all candidness that the process has gone uh, extremely well. It's been very arduous and very consuming, um, but we have, uh, I believe, uh, 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 overcome any of the hurdles or answered any of the questions and certainly demonstrated uh, the financial performance and growth within the company uh, in order to be uh, a candidate uh, for NASDAQ. So without saying more than I can say, I can say that I'm feeling very, very positive about our prospects and um, it would be uh, in the near future uh, that this would be happening, very near future. Um, but maybe I'll, uh, I'll turn that over to, to Scott and Paul for any comment if they'd like to qualify that or back me off on any of it. But uh, I'm excited about what's in front of us in terms of uh, capital markets, uh, primarily because I do believe that we'll be um, on a national market in very short order. And, um, and we'll have an institutional audience that I think really appreciates the comps in the market and the, um, the quality of the team and what they've built so far. So maybe on that front, um, uh, Roly, is there any questions or Scott that uh, you wanted to make sure that we address? Yeah, thanks so much, Cam. It's uh, Scott Larson here. Um, there are lots of questions. There's a bunch of questions that came in uh, prior to this call that were emailed in. And then of course, there's been uh, a number of questions that have been uh, sent through the online chat form. So maybe uh, just, uh, actually first and foremost, the, uh, it seems like the biggest question, I'm just kind of scrolling through them here in, in real time, certainly was with regards to NASDAQ timing and, and all the rest of it. Cam, you, you touched on that. Um, I think a little more color from my standpoint is that we have, of course, given, uh, given a number of disclosures on that. Um, I don't think we want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but uh, I think we all feel pretty positive with the direction that it's going, as you mentioned. I think a little more... Um, couple of questions here with regards to uh, the timing, the process. I don't think we want to get too far into that. Uh, maybe a question here with regards to uh, vital intelligence and some of our health tech. And so give a little more color and comment, if you can, on that. Um, what do we think the market is, perhaps? What do we think the opportunities? Are there key structures, key, key industries that were going down with that? And Cam, we'll send that back to you. Sounds great. 
Yeah, sounds good. So initially, um, uh, the vital intelligence was born out of a, a public safety customer of ours approaching us and saying and asking if it would be possible uh, to have a drone be able to uh, detect social distancing and mask wearing. And so um, we did that uh, through a camera system, our AI bench. Uh, did develop that. And so that provided that public safety customer the ability to put a drone up in the air over crowds and be able to measure how effective their public safety or their public awareness campaigns are happening, actually measure uh, the distance between people and how often they're too close or not far enough. And are they family units and how many people are wearing masks and are there areas that they do need to put boots on the ground or resources in place, you know, over the next couple of days, what are potential areas of super spreader events and things like that. And again, and again, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we turned on it quick and provided this to them. And then, um, <clears throat> uh, quite frankly, one of the uh, officers that said, well, you know, what would be really great is if you guys could detect COVID-19. And, and we took that to heart. I mean, it was, a, it was an offhanded joke of a comment. But what we did do in less than nine months was commercialize a payload or a sensor, a camera, if you will, the ability to not detect COVID-19, but detect infectious, con infectious conditions like heart rate, respiratory rate, SpO2. Uh, these are the things, even more than temperature, that are actually indicative of a um, uh, of a of um, uh, an infectious condition. So a question I get now, they're like, hey, the pandemic's ending, all this stuff, like, that's fine. But the, the, the biggest use case in the market for this isn't a pandemic. The biggest use case in market for, for this uh, is in things like telemedicine. So the use cases that we're working on today are literally that technology has been ported onto your cell phone. So you can now use your cell phone to take your heart rate and your respiratory rate. And we have telemedicine companies and universities and apps that are now looking to license that and employ it into their apps so that they can now have that as a function. We're doing things like in neonatal units, premature babies, where you can't put monitors on skin because it rips the skin right off and you've got cords going all over the place, cameras on the walls that are now monitoring those heart rates and respiratory rates. Again, somebody says, well, what has this got to do with the drone business? Well, we have military customers that are using this technology basically to confirm conditions at up to two kilometers away. You know, are people in uh, health regions or pandemic regions, are they healthy or are they not region? Uh, healthy? Are the people that uh, we're in a battle against, how are they healthy or not healthy? Do they have infectious conditions? Um, there's even been use case around uh, confirming sniper kills. So, I mean, again, that's not a great, you know, fun thing to talk about, but, but the technology that this developed and how it gets used, not just on drones, but across all cameras, is huge. And that's it's exactly why we needed to lock down this technology. We commercialized it and then decided to come down and, and lock down that technology. But the implications and the size of the market of it is a multi-billion dollar market. The fact that we can do it on, well, the fact that nobody else can really do it successfully and commercially and with third party uh, paper reviewed uh, university papers uh, is one thing. But the fact that we can do it on a drone is an entire other thing. And the access that gives us to high quality customers, whether they're government or military, or, or uh, we'll call special commercial customers that need to know that they're working with an organization that can build something like that. That's the real opportunity here. Yeah, thanks very much. I think uh, a couple of the questions here that are coming in in uh, real time um, regarding cold chain and uh, the drone deliveries. And so, uh, Cam, maybe before I pass it back to you to give a little more color on, on, on where you think the opportunity is, um, and without getting ahead of the of uh, the ongoing discussions with regards to contracts, things like that, that uh, we're still working through the disclosure phase. Talk a little bit about the drone delivery market and uh, where we think it's going to go, what we think the opportunity is, how we think we can find our niche within it, and uh, maybe take advantage of the, of uh, some of the new regulations that have that have come out by the FAA. Sounds great. Uh, just to back up a little bit on, on BI, the other big, big use case that's happening is, is, is still building entrance. Uh, but building entrance, not so much in terms of using a VI rig uh, to monitor a population coming in, you know, for a, a stadium game or something, but the staff, right? So whether it's in hospitality or entertainment, you know, mitigating the risk for that staff, because that's a returning population to, a, to, a, to the same uh, uh, building, if you will, over and over again, and making sure that if there is a health concern, that it didn't come from, from the staff that's providing those services. That's where we see uh, also a huge, huge uh, uh, growth happening uh, in that particular area. So whether that's uh, teachers or whether that's hospitality staff or whether it's 
Um, anybody that has to cater to uh, an outside group where there's potential liability of them having introduced a pathogen or some sort of health risk, we see this as a massive growth area in terms of insurance and, and health mitigation. So I just wanted to touch base on that, sorry, Scott. Um, uh, drone delivery, obviously prolific area, um, uh, definitely something that is uh, uh, growing and is uh, de facto going to happen. Um, our particular strategy is not in the, in the retail um, end of that. Uh, we think that that will become very quickly a race to the bottom. Um, you know, who can deliver the package to the most amount of places for the least amount of price. And, and it's also very regulatory uh, dependent. Um, so, and there's, and there's some big, big players in it. However, we are providing picks and shovels, technology, uh, AI uh, to those players in that particular industry. Dragonfly has the unique uh, position where the industry, where we do have a product line, but our primary um, role is to provide uh, uh, B2B services. So we have several other drone uh, companies uh, with initiatives in this space that come to us and we collaborate with them in order to provide those types of um, services. Again, whether it's software, whether it's design or whether it's actual hardware manufacturing. The area specifically that we're looking at in drone delivery is again, a bit more B2B and a bit more industrial or medical. So our background is very uh, heavily skewed towards um, uh, public safety and whether that's first responder or uh, police or fire rescue, those types of things. Um, so our initial initiative, our, our, our first really big initiative that we're focused on that we think covers a lot of other territory, uh, in particular with cold chain is, is uh, vaccine delivery is very interesting, of course, not just in North America, but in particular in uh, globally. And it's a massive market uh, globally, but uh, medical equipment and first responder emergency. I believe in the next five years, you'll see a drone not just being uh, the first responder onto a scene, say after a hurricane or a, a flood or a natural disaster or an accident, but it will be bringing in the, the emergency medical equipment that survivors on the ground need and can be used to either triage, treat themselves, look after people that are around them. That drone will also be used to do medical assessment, be able to take heart rate, um, uh, respiratory rates and things that we've talked about before. And so it's that type of underlying technology that we want to be a part of. Now, um, because of uh, the way the regulations uh, work, uh, there's very high hurdles, which we're excited about, in order for companies to be able to provide drones into this. So you, a Part 107 license, which is something that a lot of people have heard about, is the ability to actually fly a drone commercially. And today you can do drone delivery as long as it's uh, uh, within line of sight. Uh, you can fly it over people if you have parachutes and, and a couple of other check marks that you have to hit there, but it's not necessarily uh, overly scalable, except in specific use case situations. To be able, where regulation is going is where you'll have to get a part 135 <clears throat> um, uh, uh, tight cast license for the actual drones so that those drones are certified by the FAA to do certain tasks. Now we love that high hurdle because it really eliminates a lot of other people that will be in the drone delivery space and caters to our strategy of being a provider to the delivery providers. Uh, now we will certainly uh, build, operate uh, entire drone delivery ecosystems as such, what we're doing with uh, Cold Chain, who is one of the largest uh, uh, medical vaccine, uh, vaccine uh, logistics companies in the States. For example, they handle all the vaccines in Texas, the entire city of Chicago, and, and the list goes on. And the reason that they came to us is because they see this as a strategic advantage for them, but they needed a turnkey solution. So they can provide the subject matter expertise better than anybody else, better than a drone company can for sure, which is why we partnered with them. But what they wanted was specialized drones, regulatory adherence. They wanted the operations afterward, and they wanted to be in a situation where their core business has a strategic advantage over all other uh, of their competitors because of the service, but they don't necessarily want to be in the drone industry. So we'll look at doing full turnkey services uh, for people and or we'll look at providing technology or business to business services or uh, parts or IP to other people that are in the business. Okay, thanks, Cam. Um... There's, yeah, there's been a number of questions that have already been answered in the chat uh, with regards to uh, some of the companies that are working with a couple of the other opportunities. Um, maybe the final question that we'll take here uh, before, because we're certainly cognizant of time and all the rest of it, is um, with regards to international expansion. And so I'll just, I'll just quickly answer this, of course. Uh, the question is, any interest plans for international expansion? I think... Um, 
we're, we're, we're certainly up to our neck with opportunities, as, as, as Cam has mentioned here in North America, uh, different sectors, different markets, different industries, both, both existing as well as, as, as upcoming. Uh, I can say that we've had a number of inbound calls from groups uh, across Europe, as well as some into Asia, about looking at projects together. Uh, I don't think we want to get ahead of ourselves on that, uh, given how much work we have here in North America and with existing partners and uh, some of the initiatives that we're looking at. But I will say um, there are opportunities overseas. Uh, the regulations are a little bit different. Um, we've, we've been looking at it for the last seven or eight months, I would say, um, to maybe even a little bit longer ways to expand over there. And so I think when the time is right and the opportunity is right, we'll come up with some more announcements on that. Um, but Cam, do you wanna give any more color on to uh, Veragard Sprain? Uh, some of the things we're looking at, uh, maybe just a quick update here that, that uh, fits within disclosures, but perhaps some of the things we're gonna be hoping to get ahead wrapped around over the next little bit. You bet. Drone spraying as a service is, uh, will certainly be one of those prolific industries that kind of kind of like delivery, maybe not to the same noticeable extent, but it's such an efficient way to apply <clears throat> um, uh, sprays, whether it's uh, something like our proprietary Veragard spray, uh, which kills pathogens for 20 hours plus in the location, or, or whether it's agricultural, whether it's industrial, um, these are the types of things that spraying uh, is all about. And this is why we're so excited about the spraying industry. Now, of course, there's immediate application over the last year. And surprisingly, to more, more than what people, I believe, realize over the course of the next, well, as an ongoing basis, uh, being able to do spraying uh, to prevent pathogens. Um, uh, we do think that there's uh, some strains out there that are going to emerge. There's going to be some some surges in particular areas. And, you know, I also don't believe that North America uh, and hopefully the world, but certainly North America is going to get flat -foot, caught flat-footed again in this situation. And so that's why we see the top organizations in the world that have these large venues, uh, for example, uh, their, their demand and their requirements continue and to look at spraying services and to make sure that, that they're not in a situation where uh, if a surge or a pathogen, whatever it is, whether it's this current uh, COVID-19 or, or the next COVID or some other coronavirus, et cetera, that, that they're not going to be in a situation where they're caught uh, as a super spreader event or they have uh, liability around it. Uh, but interestingly enough, whether it's um, uh, 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 pathogen prevention um, in agriculture, uh, whether it's crop spraying, whether it's uh, industrial spraying uh, onto roads or, uh, or into energy fields or uh, into de-icing or whatever the case is, spraying technology is a big, big part of the, of the drone industry. At this point, I feel comfortable saying that we're probably the leaders in that space. And so we view it very similar to how we view mining. We can go and fly a mining service and just being a mining service flyer is a race to the bottom. But what we have is particular AI and a, and a co-product with uh, Windfall Geotech that makes us special, that allows us to do something that nobody else in the mining market can do. Now, we're also combining this with, with specialized payloads and payloads um, that we're building to then further supplement the AI that we can provide. That's what gives us a strategic advantage. And in spraying, our Veragard relationship and product development was all about being able to do something that nobody else in spraying can do. But if you think about all the industrial applications, all the agricultural applications, and, and the list goes on, we'll take that same approach. It's not just about the drone, but it's about the payload that we can provide and the product that we can apply in order to give us a strategic advantage. Having a robust, large infrastructure of up to 500 crews uh, corporately, and maybe the rest uh, potentially under another structure uh, across North America, we believe will be in a really important part of the strategy to ensure that Dragonfly can dominate services in this industry. Okay, thanks, Cam. I'm just um, trying to manage. We got questions coming in via email over the chat, of course. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, the NASDAQ uplisting. Um, I think we can say that there'll be more information coming out on that over the next little bit. Uh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves and in, in saying things before they happen, but uh, I think as Cam mentioned, we feel pretty good about it at this point for sure. Uh, we've talked about uh, cold chain, drone delivery. We've talked about VI, uh, vital intelligence, um, uh, sprain, uh, international expansion, uh, maybe just a final question or comment here on um, 
and then and then we'll look to wrap it up given you know just cognizant of everyone's time and everything like that um there's been questions about the contract status we'll 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 come up with disclosures as those happen for sure um where do we see dragonfly to be in the next little bit like so are there are there sectors that you think we're going to be that we're going to be looking at opportunities outside of some of the things you've talked about um where do you see where do you see dragonfly being and not talking about revenues of course but where do you where do you see dragonfly fitting into the overall drone market over the next two to three years so from a very high conceptual standpoint, I believe that there's going to be a number one and number two player that will be highly identifiable that the Fortune 5000 will look to rely upon to provide their drone services. Um, that, that's, that's going to be the old adage of nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM. That's what Dragonfly aims to be in the drone uh, industry. Given the security, the data uh, collectability, uh, the strategic advantage that people have from using drones in a certain way, this is a critical component of pretty much any business um, out there. Certainly any of the Fortune 5000 companies will have use for drones. And most Fortune 5000 companies haven't even begun to understand, much less explore the possibilities of what they can do with drones. And as they learn that more and more over time, they'll realize the critical nature of the drone and the capabilities of it. And they'll look again to that higher and higher quality player, which, which is why we are <clears throat> aiming and very aggressively moving towards NASDAQ. It's why we have the type of board that we have. It's why we're signed the type of customers that we've signed. Um, you know, the brands that we have on, we're very, very conscious and of being able to attract those types of things. So we are a total solution provider in an industry. Today, we only talk about things that customers can understand. So we talk about things like delivery. We talk about things um, like spraying, but even spraying and certainly our, our vital intelligence technology, that's right on the leading edge of what people can understand that a drone could do. But I can assure you, uh, our audience here, that that is not what we are thinking about. That's what we're talking about. But what we are thinking about and what we see coming down for what drones can do and what some of our customers will be doing with them is truly, truly game changing. You want to talk about innovative disruption and what something like Tesla is doing in the electrical market. It's it, it that scratches the surface compared to what drones and autonomy will be doing um, in the uh, in in fact across every industry, not just the automotive um, industry. So we, we're we're going to keep talking about things that we do in mining and things that we do in manufacturing and our military customers and our education customers and things that are graspable. But I can tell you that that is not what we're what what we're thinking about. What we're thinking and what we're going to innovate um, about you know for five years from now are the same types of things you know five years ago when we said we were going to do X Y and Z and Z, people said that was crazy and we did it. It's the reason that we're going to stay the, the innovative and number one player in this market. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, thanks, Cam, for that. Thanks to the audience here um, who. Uh, uh, dialed in, listen to listen to uh, to what we're doing. Thanks, Paul, for update on the financial statements um, and and the last queue. Uh, I think uh, with that, we'll look to wrap it up. Cam, do you want to uh, uh, close us down, and then we can go from there? Um, I think this uh, first and foremost, I really want to thank uh, the team members that we get to work with, our employees. Uh, the management team, the board of directors, uh, I mean, you really feel this is a team. You, I mean, I am just beyond honored to be able to work at this with you. And uh, the commitment that you guys, everybody puts in the nights and the weekends and just, it's just, it's, in, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it's a complete insanity. And I understand the sacrifices everybody's making um, uh, amongst their families and stuff. So first and foremost, thanks to everybody in the company. Thanks um, to our customers. Um, you, you know, you trust us, you believe us, you work hard with us, you push us. And so we really want to continue to earn your trust. And of course, thanks to our shareholders. Uh, of course, if you weren't here believing uh, in, in what we're laying down and the numbers we're putting up, uh, we couldn't be doing this. We are, we're not perfect by any stretch. We're, we're learning as we go, but I can assure you, you do not have a more committed team. Thank you for your time.